Chapter forty eight, part four of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume four, by Sir Edward Gibbon. Chapter forty eight. Succession and Character of the Greek Emperors, Part Four. Among the warriors who promoted his elevation and served under his standard, a noble and valiant Armenian had deserved and obtained the most eminent rewards. The statue of John Zimiscus was below the ordinary standard, but this diminutive body was endowed with strength, beauty, and the soul of a hero. By the jealousy of the emperor's brother, he was degraded from the office of general of the east to that of director of the posts, and his murmurs were chastised with disgrace and exile. But Zimiscus was ranked among the numerous lovers of the empress. On her intercession, he was permitted to reside at Chalcedon, in the neighbourhood of the capital. Her bounty was repaid in his clandestine and amorous visits to the palace and Theophano consented, with alacrity, to the death of an ugly and penurious husband. Some bold and trusty conspirators were concealed in her most private chambers. In the darkness of a winter night, Zemiscus, with his principal companions, embarked in a small boat, traversed the Bosphorus, landed at the palace stairs, and silently ascended a ladder of ropes, which was cast down by the female attendants. Neither his own suspicions, nor the warnings of his friends, nor the tardy aid of his brother Leo, nor the fortress which he had erected in the palace, could prevent Nicephorus from a domestic foe, at whose voice every door was open to the assassin. As he slept on a bearskin on the ground, he was roused by their noisy intrusion, and thirty daggers glittered before his eyes. It is doubtful whether Zemiscus imbrued his hands in the blood of his sovereign, but he enjoyed the inhumane spectacle of revenge. The murder was protracted by insult and cruelty, and as soon as the head of Nicephorus was shown from the window, the tumult was hushed, and the Armenian was emperor of the East. On the day of his coronation he was stopped on the threshold of St. Sophia by the intrepid patriarch who charged his conscience with the deed of treason and blood, and required, as a sign of repentance, that he should separate himself from his more criminal associate. This sally of apostolic zeal was not offensive to the prince, since he could neither love nor trust a woman who had repeatedly violated the most sacred obligations. And Theophano, instead of sharing his imperial fortune, was dismissed with ignominy from his bed and palace. In their last interview, she displayed a frantic and impotent rage, accused the ingratitude of her lover, assaulted with words and blows her son Basil, as he stood silent and submissive in the presence of a superior colleague, and avowed her own prostitution in proclaiming the illegitimacy of his birth. The public indignation was appeased by her exile and the punishment of the meaner accomplices. The death of an unpopular prince was forgiven, and the guilt of Zemiscus was forgotten in the splendour of his virtues. Perhaps his profusion was less useful to the state than the avarice of Nicephorus, but his gentle and generous behaviour delighted all who approached his person, and it was only in the paths of victory that he trod in the footsteps of his predecessor. The greatest part of his reign was employed in the camp and the field. His personal valour and activity were signalised on the Danube and the Tigris, the ancient boundaries of the Roman world. And by his double triumph over the Russians and the Saracens, he deserved the titles of saviour of the empire and conqueror of the east. In his last return from Syria, he observed that the most fruitful lands of his new provinces were possessed by the eunuchs. "'And is it for them?' he exclaimed with honest indignation. 
that we have fought and conquered? Is it for them that we shed our blood and exhaust the treasures of our people? The complaint was re-echoed to the palace, and the death of Zemiscus is strongly marked with the suspicion of poison. Under this usurpation, or regency, of twelve years, the two lawful emperors, Basil and Constantine, had silently grown to the age of manhood. Their tender years had been incapable of dominion. The respectful modesty of their attendance and salutation was due to the age and merit of their guardians. The childless ambitions of those guardians had no temptation to violate the right of succession. Their patrimony was ably and faithfully administered, and the premature death of Zemiscus was a loss rather than a benefit to the sons of Romanus. Their want of experience detained them twelve years longer, the obscure and voluntary pupils of a minister, who extended his reign by persuading them to indulge the pleasures of youth, and to disdain the labours of government. In this silken web the weakness of Constantine was forever entangled, but his elder brother felt the impulse of genius and the desire of action. He frowned, and the minister was no more. Basil was the acknowledged sovereign of Constantinople and the provinces of Europe. But Asia was oppressed by two veteran generals, Phocus and Sclerus, who, alternately friends and enemies, subjects and rebels, maintained their independence, and laboured to emulate the example of successful usurpation. Against these domestic enemies, the son of Romanus first drew his sword, and they trembled in the presence of a lawful and high-spirited prince. The first, in the front of battle, was thrown from his horse, by the stroke of poison or an arrow. The second, who had been twice loaded with chains, and twice invested with the purple, was desirous of ending in peace the small remainder of his days. As the aged suppliant approached the throne, with dim eyes and faltering steps, leaning on his two attendants, the emperor exclaimed, in the insolence of youth and power, And is this the man who has been so long the object of our terror? After he had confirmed his own authority, and the peace of the empire, the trophies of Nicephorus and Zemiscus would not suffer their royal pupil to sleep in the palace. His long and frequent expeditions against the Saracens were rather glorious than useful to the empire. But the final destruction of the kingdom of Bulgaria appears, since the time of Belisarius, the most important triumph of the Roman arms. Yet, instead of applauding their victorious prince, his subjects detested the rapacious and rigid avarice of Basil. And in the imperfect narrative of his exploits, we can only discern the courage, patience, and ferociousness of a soldier. A vicious education, which could not subdue his spirit, had clouded his mind. He was ignorant of every science, and the remembrance of his learned and feeble grandsire might encourage his real or affected contempt of laws and lawyers, of artists and arts. Of such a character in such an age, superstition took a firm and lasting possession. After the first license of his youth, Basil II devoted his life, in the palace and the camp, to the penance of a hermit, while the monistic habit under his robes and armour observed a vow of countenance, and imposed on his appetites a perpetual abstinence from wine and flesh. In the sixty-eighth year of his age, his martial spirit urged him to embark in person for a holy war against the Saracens of Sicily. He was prevented by death, and Basil, surnamed the Slayer of the Bulgarians, was dismissed from the world with the blessings of the clergy and the curse of the people. After his decease, his brother Constantine enjoyed, about three years, the power, or rather the pleasures, of royalty, and his only care was the settlement of the succession. He had enjoyed sixty-six years the title of Augustus, and the reign of the two brothers is the longest and most obscure of the Byzantine history.
a lineal succession of five emperors, in a period of one hundred and sixty years, had attached the loyalty of the Greeks to the Macedonian dynasty, which had been thrice respected by the usurpers of their power. After the death of Constantine the Ninth, the last male of the royal race, a new and broken scene presents itself, and the accumulated years of twelve emperors do not equal the space of his single reign. His elder brother had preferred his private chastity to the public interest, and Constantine himself had only three daughters, Eudocia, who took the veil, and Zoe and Theodora, who were preserved till a mature age in a state of ignorance and virginity. When their marriage was discussed in the council of their dying father, the cold or pious Theodora refused to give an heir to the empire. But her sister Zoe presented herself a willing victim at the altar. Romanus Argyrus, a patrician of a graceful person and fair reputation, was chosen for her husband, and, on his declining that honour, was informed that blindness or death was the second alternative. The motive of his reluctance was conjugal affection, but his faithful wife sacrificed her own happiness to his safety and greatness, and her entrance into a monastery removed the only bar to the imperial nuptials. After the decease of Constantine, the sceptre devolved to Romanus the Third, but his labours at home and abroad were equally feeble and fruitless. And the mature age, the forty-eight years of Zoe, were less favourable to the hopes of pregnancy than to the indulgence of pleasure. Her favourite chamberlain was a handsome pathologian of the name of Michael, whose first trade had been that of a money-changer. And Romanus, either from gratitude or equity, connived at their criminal intercourse, or accepted a slight assurance of their innocence. But Zoe soon justified the Roman maxim, that every adulteress is capable of poisoning her husband, and the death of Romanus was instantly followed by the scandalous marriage and elevation of Michael the Fourth. The expectations of Zoe were, however, disappointed. Instead of a vigorous and grateful lover, she had placed in her bed a miserable wretch, whose health and reason were impaired by epileptic fits, and whose conscience was tormented by despair and remorse. The most skilful physicians of the mind and body were summoned to his aid, and his hopes were amused by frequent pilgrimages to the baths, and to the tombs of the most popular saints. The monks applauded his penance, and, except restitution, but to whom should he have restored, Michael sought every method of expiating his guilt. While he groaned and prayed in sackcloth and ashes, his brother, the eunuch John, smiled at his remorse, and enjoyed the harvest of a crime of which himself was the secret and most guilty author. His administration was the only art of satiating his avarice, and so he became a captive in the palace of her father's, and in the hands of her slaves. When he perceived the irretrievable decline of his brother's health, he introduced his nephew, another Michael, who derived his surname of Caliphates, from his father's occupation in the careening of vessels. At the command of the eunuch, Zoe adopted for her son the son of a mechanic, and this fictitious heir was invested with the title and purple of the Caesars, in the presence of the senate and clergy. So feeble was the character of Zoe, that she was oppressed by the liberty and power which she recovered by the death of the Paphlagonian, and at the end of four days she placed the crown on the head of Michael V, who had protested, with tears and oaths, that he should ever reign the first and most obedient of her subjects. The only act of his short reign was his base ingratitude to his benefactors, the eunuch and the empress. The disgrace of the former was pleasing to the public, but the murmurs, and at length the clamours, of Constantinople deplored the exile of Zoe, the daughter of so many emperors. 
her vices were forgotten, and Michael was taught that there is a period in which the patience of the tamest slaves rises into fury and revenge. The citizens of every degree assembled in a formidable tumult, which lasted three days. They besieged the palace, forced the gates, recalled their mothers, Zoe from her prison, Theodora from a monastery, and condemned the son of Caliphatus to the loss of his eyes or his life. For the first time the Greeks beheld with surprise the two royal sisters seated on the same throne, presiding in the senate, and giving audience to the ambassadors of the nations. But the singular union subsisted no more than two months. The two sovereigns, their tempers, interests, and adherents, were secretly hostile to each other. And as Theodora was still averse to marriage, the indefatigable Zoe, at the age of sixty, consented, for the public good, to sustain the embraces of a third husband and the censures of the Greek church. His name and number were Constantine the Tenth, and the epithet of Monomachus, the single combatant, must have been expressive of his valour and victory in some public or private quarrel. But his health was broken by the tortures of the gout, and his dissolute reign was spent in the alternative of sickness and pleasure. A fair and noble widow had accompanied Constantine in his exile to the Isle of Lesbos, and Sclerina gloried in the appellation of his mistress. After his marriage and elevation, she was invested with the title and pomp of Augusta, and occupied a contiguous apartment in the palace. The lawful consort, such was the delicacy or corruption of Zoe, consented to this strange and scandalous partition, and the emperor appeared in public between his wife and his concubine. He survived them both, but the last measures of Constantine to change the order of succession were prevented by the more vigilant friends of Theodora, and after his decease she resumed, with the general consent, the possession of her inheritance. In her name, and by the influence of four eunuchs, the eastern world was peaceably governed about nineteen months. And as they wished to prolong their dominion, they persuaded the aged princess to nominate for her successor, Michael the Sixth. The surname of Stratioticus declares his military profession. But the crazy and decrepit veteran could only see with the eyes and execute with the hands of his ministers. Whilst he ascended the throne, Theodora sunk into the grave, the last of the Macedonian or Basilian dynasty. I have hastily reviewed, and gladly dismiss, this shameful and destructive period of twenty-eight years, in which the Greeks, degraded below the common level of servitude, were transferred like a herd of cattle by the choice or caprice of two impotent females. From this night of slavery, a ray of freedom, or at least of spirit, begins to emerge. The Greeks either preserved or revived the use of surnames, which perpetrate the fame of hereditary virtue, and we now discern the rise, succession, and alliances of the last dynasties of Constantinople and Trebizond. The Komnenai, who upheld for a while the fate of the sinking empire, assumed the honour of a Roman origin. But the family had been long since transported from Italy to Asia. Their patrimonial estate was situated in the district of Castamona, in the neighbourhood of the Euxin. And one of their chiefs, who had already entered the paths of ambition, revisited with affection, perhaps with regret, the modest though honourable dwellings of his fathers, the first of their line was the illustrious Manuel, who, in the reign of the second battle, contributed by war and treaty to appease the troubles of the East. He left, in a tender age, two sons, Isaac and John, whom, with the consciousness of desert, he bequeathed to the gratitude and favour of his sovereign. 
the noble youths were carefully trained in the learning of the monastery, the arts of the palace, and the exercises of the camp. And from the domestic service of the guards, they were rapidly promoted to the command of provinces and armies. Their fraternal union doubled the force and reputation of the Komnenni, and their ancient nobility was illustrated by the marriage of the two brothers, with the captive princess of Bulgaria, and the daughter of a patrician, who had obtained the name of Charon, from the number of enemies whom he had sent to the infernal shades. The soldiers had served with reluctant loyalty a series of effeminate masters. The elevation of Michael the Sixth was a personal insult to the more deserving generals, and their discontent was inflamed by the parsimony of the emperor and the insolence of the eunuchs. They secretly assembled in the sanctuary of St. Sophia, and the votes of the military synod would have been unanimous in favour of the old and valiant Catacaulon. If the patriotism or modesty of the veteran had not suggested the importance of birth, as well as merit in the choice of a sovereign. Isaac Comnenus was approved by general consent, and the associates separated without delay to meet in the plains of Phrygia, at the head of their respective squadrons and detachments. The cause of Michael was defended in a single battle by the mercenaries of the imperial guard, who were aliens to the public interest, and animated only by a principle of honour and gratitude. After their defeat, the fears of the emperor solicited a treaty, which was almost accepted by the moderation of the Comnenian. But the former was betrayed by his ambassadors, and the latter was prevented by his friends. The solitary Michael submitted to the voice of the people. The patriarch annulled their oath of allegiance, and as he shaved the head of the royal monk, congratulated his beneficial exchange of temporal royalty for the kingdom of heaven. An exchange, however, which the priest, on his own account, would probably have declined. By the hands of the same patriarch, Isaac Comnenus was solemnly crowned. The sword which he inscribed on his coins might have been an offensive symbol, if it implied his title by conquests but this sword would have been drawn against the foreign and domestic enemies of the state. The decline of his health and vigour suspended the operation of active virtue, and the prospect of approaching death determined him to interpose some moments between life and eternity. But instead of leaving the empire as the marriage portion of his daughter, his reason and inclination concurred in the preference of his brother John a soldier, a patriot, and the father of five sons, the future pillars of an hereditary succession. His first modest reluctance might be the natural dictates of discretion and tenderness, but his obstinate and successful perseverance, however it may dazzle with the show of virtue, must be censured as a criminal desertion of his duty, and a rare offence against his family and country. The purple which he had refused was accepted by Constantine Ducas, a friend of the Comnenian house, and whose noble birth was adorned with the experience and reputation of civil policy. In the monistic habit, Isaac recovered his health, and survived two years his voluntary abdication. At the command of his abbot, he observed the rule of St. Basil, and executed the most servile offices of the convent but his latent vanity was gratified by the frequent and respectful visits of the reigning monarch, who revered in his person the character of a benefactor and a saint. If Constantine the Eleventh was indeed the subject most worthy of an empire, we must pity the debasement of the age and nation in which he was chosen. In the labour of puerile declamations he sought, without obtaining, the crown of eloquence, more precious in his opinion than that of Rome. And in the subordinate functions of a judge, he forgot the duties of a sovereign and a warrior. Far from imitating the patriotic indifference of the authors of his greatness, Ducasse was anxious only to secure, at the expense of the Republic, 
the power and prosperity of his children. His three sons, Michael the Seventh, Andronicus the First, and Constantine the Twelfth, were invested, in a tender age, with the equal title of Augustus, and the succession was speedily opened by their father's death. His widow Eudocia was entrusted with the administration, but experience had taught the jealousy of the dying monarch to protect his sons from the danger of her second nuptials. And her solemn engagement, attested by the principal senators, was deposited in the hands of the patriarch. Before the end of seven months, the wants of Eudocia, or those of the state, called aloud for the male virtues of a soldier, and her heart had already chosen Romanus, Diogenes, whom she raised from the scaffold to the throne. The discovery of a treasonable attempt had exposed him to the severity of the laws. His beauty and valour dissolved him in the eyes of the empress, and Romanus, from a mild exile, was recalled on the second day to the command of the oriental armies. Her royal choice was yet unknown to the public, and the promise which she would have betrayed her falsehood and levity was stolen by a dexterous emissary from the ambition of the patriarch. Cyphilian at first alleged the sanctity of oaths and the sacred nature of a trust, but a whisper that his brother was the future emperor relaxed his scruples and forced him to confess that the public safety was the supreme law. He resigned the important paper, and when his hopes were confounded by the nomination of Romanus, he could no longer regain his security, retract his declarations, nor oppose the second nuptials of the empress. Yet a murmur was heard in the palace, and the barbarian guards had raised their battle-axes in the cause of the house of Lucas, till the young princes were soothed by the tears of their mother, and the solemn assurances of the fidelity of their guardian, who filled the imperial station with dignity and honour. Hereafter I shall relate his valiant, but unsuccessful, efforts to resist the progress of the Turks. His defeat and captivity inflicted a deadly wound on the Byzantine monarchy of the East, and after he was released from the chains of the Sultan, he vainly sought his wife and his subjects. His wife had been thrust into a monastery, and the subjects of Romanus had embraced the rigid maxim of the civil law that a prisoner in the hands of the enemy is deprived, as by the stroke of death, of all the public and private rights of a citizen. In the general consternation, the Caesar John asserted the indefeasible right of his three nephews. Constantinople listened to his voice, and the Turkish captive was proclaimed in the capital, and received on the frontier as an enemy of the Republic. Romanus was not more fortunate in domestic than in foreign war. The loss of two battles compelled him to yield, on the assurance of fair and honourable treatment, but his enemies were devoid of faith or humanity, and, after the cruel extinction of his sight, his wounds were left to bleed and corrupt, till in a few days he was relieved from a state of misery. Under the triple reign of the house of Ducas, the two younger brothers were reduced to the vain honours of the purple. But the eldest, the pusillanimous Michael, was incapable of sustaining the Roman sceptre, and his surname of Parapinicus denotes the reproach which he shared with an avaricious favourite, who enhanced the price and diminished the measure of wheat. In the school of Psellus, and after the example of his mother, the son of Eudocia made some proficiency in philosophy and rhetoric, but his character was degraded rather than ennobled by the virtues of a monk and the learning of a sophist. Strong in the contempt of their sovereign and their own esteem, two generals, at the head of the European and Asiatic legions, assumed the purple at Adrianople and Nice. Their revolt was in the same months. They bore the same name of Nicephorus, but the two candidates were distinguished by the surnames of Bryennius and Botaniatus. 
the former in the maturity of wisdom and courage, the latter conspicuous only by the memory of his past exploits. While Botaniatus advanced with cautious and dilatory steps, his active competitors stood in arms before the gates of Constantinople. The name of Bryennius was illustrious, his cause was popular, but his licentious troops could not be restrained from burning and pillaging a suburb, and the people, who would have hailed the rebel, rejected and repulsed the incendiary of his country. This change of the public opinion was favourable to Botaniatus, who at length, with an army of Turks, approached the shores of Chalcedon. A formal invitation, in the name of the Patriarch, the Sinoid, and the Senate, was circulated through the streets of Constantinople, and the General Assembly, in the Dome of St. Sophia, debated, with order and calmness, on the choice of their sovereign. The guards of Michael would have dispersed this unarmed multitude, but the feeble emperor, applauding his own moderation and clemency, resigned the ensigns of royalty, and was rewarded with the monistic habit, and the title of Archbishop of Ephesus. He left a son, a Constantine, born and educated in the purple, and a daughter of the house of Ducas, illustrated the blood, and confirmed the succession of the Comnenian dynasty. John Comnenius, the brother of the Emperor Isaac, survived in peace and dignity his generous refusal of the sceptre, by his wife Anne, a woman of masculine spirit and a policy, he left eight children. The three daughters multiplied the Comnenian alliance with the noblest of the Greeks. Of the five sons, Manuel was stopped by a premature death. Isaac and Alexis restored the imperial greatness of their house, which was enjoyed without toil or danger by the two younger brethren, Adrian and Nicephorus. Alexis, the third and most illustrious of the brothers, was endowed by nature with the choicest gifts of mind and body. They were cultivated by a liberal education, and exercised in the school of obedience and adversity. The youth was dismissed from the perils of the Turkish war by the paternal care of the Emperor Romanus. But the mother of the Komnenni, with her aspiring face, was accused of treason and banished by the sons of Ducas, to an island in the Propontis. The two brothers soon emerged into favour and action, fought by each other's side against the rebels and barbarians, and adhered to the Emperor Michael, till he was deserted by the world and by himself. In his first interview with Botaniatus, Prince, said Alexis with a noble frankness, my duty rendered me your enemy. The decrees of God and of the people have made me your subject. Judge of my future loyalty by my past opposition. The successor of Michael entertained him with esteem and confidence. His valour was employed against three rebels, who disturbed the peace of the empire, or at least of the emperors. Ursel, Briennius, and Basilatius, were formidable by their numerous forces and military fame. They were successfully vanquished in the field, and led in chains to the foot of the throne, and whatever treatment they might receive from a timid and cruel court, they applauded the clemency, as well as the courage, of their conqueror. But the loyalty of the Comemni was soon tainted by fear and suspicion. Nor is it easy to settle between a subject and a despot, the debt of gratitude, which the former is tempted to claim by a revolt, and the latter to discharge by an executioner. The refusal of Alexis to march against a fourth rebel, the husband of his sister, destroyed the merit or memory of his past services. The favourites of Botaniatus provoked the ambition which they apprehended and accused, and the retreat of the two brothers might be justified by the defence of their life and liberty. The women of the family were deposited in a sanctuary, respected by tyrants. The men, mounted on horseback, sallied from the city, 
and erected the standard of civil war. The soldiers, who had been gradually assembled in the capital and the neighbourhood, were devoted to the cause of a victorious and injured leader. The ties of common interest and domestic alliance secured the attachment of the house of Ducasse, and the generous dispute of the Comenni was terminated by the decisive resolution of Isaac, who was the first to invest his younger brother with the name and ensigns of royalty. They returned to Constantinople, to threaten rather than besiege the impregnable fortress. But the fidelity of the guards was corrupted, a gate was surprised, and the fleet was occupied by the active courage of George Palais Logus, who fought against his father, without foreseeing that he laboured for his posterity. Alexis ascended the throne, and his aged competitor disappeared in a monastery. An army of various nations was gratified with the pillage of the city, but the public disorders were expiated by the tears and farce of the Comemni, who submitted to every penance compatible with the possession of the empire. The life of the Emperor Alexis has been delineated by a favourite daughter, who was inspired by a tender regard for his person, and a laudable zeal to perpetuate his virtues. Conscious of the just suspicions of her readers, the Princess Anna Comnena repeatedly protests that, besides her personal knowledge, she had searched the discourses and writings of the most respected veterans, and, after an interval of thirty years, forgotten by and forgetful of the world, her mournful solitude was inaccessible to hope and fear, and that truth, the naked perfect truth, was more dear and sacred than the memory of her parent. Yet, instead of the simplicity of style and narrative which wins our belief, an elaborate affectation of rhetoric and science betrays in every page the vanity of a female author. The genuine character of Alexis is lost in a vague constellation of virtues, and the perpetual strain of panegyric and apology awakens our jealousy to question the veracity of the historian and the merit of the hero. We cannot, however, refuse her judicious and important remark that the discords of the time were the misfortune and the glory of Alexis, and that every calamity which can afflict a declining empire was accumulated on his reign by the justice of heaven and the vices of his predecessors. In the east, the victorious Turks had spread, from Persia to the Hellespont, the reign of the Korean and the Crescent, the West was invaded by the adventurous valour of the Normans, and, in the moments of peace, the Danube poured forth new swarms, who had gained, in the science of war, what they had lost in the ferociousness of manners. The sea was not less hostile than the land, and while the frontiers were assaulted by an open enemy, the palace was distracted with secret treason and conspiracy. On a sudden, the banner of the cross was displayed by the Latins. Europe was precipitated on Asia, and Constantinople had almost been swept away by this impetuous deluge. In the tempest, Alexis steered the imperial vessel with dexterity and courage. At the head of his armies he was bold in action, skilful in stratagem, patient of fatigue, ready to improve his advantages, and rising from his defeats with inexhaustible vigour. The discipline of the camp was revived, and a new generation of men and soldiers was created by the example and precepts of their leader. In his intercourse with the Latins, Alexis was patient and artful. His discerning eye pervaded the new system of an unknown world, and I shall hereafter describe the superior policy with which he balanced the interests and passions of the champions of the First Crusade. In a long reign of thirty-seven years, he subdued and pardoned the envy of his equals. The laws of public and private order were restored. The arts of wealth and science were cultivated. The limits of the empire were enlarged in Europe and Asia. And the Comnenian sceptre was transmitted to his children of the third and fourth generation. Yet the difficulties of the times betrayed some defects in his character 
and have exposed his memory to some just or ungenerous reproach. The reader may possibly smile at the lavish praise which his daughter so often bestows on a flying hero. The weakness or prudence of his situation might be mistaken for a want of personal courage, and his political arts are branded by the Latins with the names of deceit and dissimulation. The increase of the male and female branches of his family adorned the throne and secured the succession, but their princely luxury and pride offended the patricians, exhausted the revenue, and insulted the misery of the people. Anna is a faithful witness that his happiness was destroyed and his health was broken by the cares of a public life. The patience of Constantinople was fatigued by the length and severity of his reign, and before Alexis expired, he had lost the love and reverence of his subjects. The clergy could not forgive his application of the sacred riches to the defence of the state, but they applauded his theological learning and ardent zeal for the orthodox faith, which he defended with his tongue, his pen, and his sword. His character was degraded by the superstition of the Greeks, and the same inconstant principle of human nature enjoined the emperor to found a hospital for the poor and infirm, and to direct the execution of a heretic who was burned alive in the square of St. Sophia. Even the sincerity of his moral and religious virtues was suspected by the persons who had passed their lives in his familiar confidence. In his last hours, when he was pressed by his wife Irene to alter the succession, he raised his head and breathed a pious ejaculation on the vanity of this world. The indignant reply of the empress may be inscribed as an epithet on his tomb. You die as you have lived, a hypocrite! It was the wish of Irene to supplant the eldest of her surviving sons, in favour of her daughter, the Princess Anne, whose philosophy would not have refused the weight of a diadem. But the order of male succession was asserted by the friends of their country. The lawful heir drew the royal signet from the finger of his insensible or conscious father, and the empire obeyed the master of the palace. Anna Comnenna, was stimulated by ambition and revenge to conspire against the life of her brother, and when the design was prevented by the fears or scruples of her husband, she passionately exclaimed that nature had mistaken the two sexes, and had endowed Bryennius with the soul of a woman. The two sons of Alexis, John and Isaac, maintained their fraternal concord, the hereditary virtue of their race, and the younger brother was content with the title of Sebastocrator, which approached the dignity, without sharing the power, of the emperor. In the same person, the claims of primogeniture and merit were fortunately united. His swarthy complexion, harsh features, and diminutive stature, had suggested the ironical surname of Callo Johannes, or John the Handsome, which his grateful subjects more seriously applied to the beauties of his mind. After the discovery of her treason, the life and fortune of Anne were justly fortified to the laws. Her life was spared by the clemency of the emperor, but he visited the pomp and treasures of her palace, and bestowed the rich confiscation on the most deserving of his friends. That respectable friend, Aksak, a slave of Turkish extraction, presumed to decline the gift, and to intercede for the criminal. His generous master applauded and imitated the virtue of his favourite, and the reproach or complaint of an injured brother was the only chastisement of the guilty princess. After this example of clemency, the remainder of his reign was never disturbed by conspiracy or rebellion. Feared by his nobles, beloved by his people, John was never reduced to the painful necessity of punishing, or even of pardoning, his personal enemies. During his government of twenty-five years, the penalty of death was abolished in the Roman Empire, a law of mercy most delightful to the human theorist, but of which the practice, 
in a large and vicious community, is seldom consistent with the public safety. Severe to himself, indulgent to others, chaste, frugal, abstemious, the philosophic Marcus would not have disdained the artless virtues of his successor, derived from his heart, and not borrowed from the schools. He despised and moderated the stately magnificence of the Byzantine court, so oppressive to the people, so contemptible to the eye of reason. Under such a prince, innocence had nothing to fear, and merit had everything to hope. And, without assuming the tyrannic office of a censor, he introduced a gradual, though visible, reformation in the public and private manners of Constantinople. The only defect of this accomplished character was the frailty of noble minds, the love of arms and military glory. Yet the frequent expeditions of John the Handsome may be justified, at least in their principle, by the necessity of repelling the Turks from the Hellespont and the Bosphorus. The sultan of Iconium was confined to his capital, the barbarians were driven to the mountains, and the maritime provinces of Asia enjoyed the transient blessings of their deliverance. From Constantinople to Antioch and Aleppo, he repeatedly marched at the head of a victorious army, and in the sieges and battles of this holy war, his Latin allies were astonished by the superior spirit and prowess of a Greek. As he began to indulge the ambitious hope of restoring the ancient limits of the empire, as he revolved in his mind, the Euphrates and the Tigris, the dominion of Syria, and the conquest of Jerusalem, the thread of his life and of the public felicity was broken by a singular accident. He hunted the wild boar in the valley of Anazarbus, and had fixed his javelin in the body of the furious animal. But in the struggle a poisoned arrow dropped from his quiver, and a slight wound in his hand, which produced a mortification, was fatal to the best and greatest of the Comnenian princes. End of chapter 48, part 4